I'm like a wedding planner minus the wedding. Last year, I planned one of the most wonderful parties. So I had enchiladas, enchiladas con pollo, enchiladas con queso, enchiladas con carne asada, rice and beans. I hired a clown, a mariachi band, and a bouncy house. Then I alerted the media to invite everyone. 200 people showed up. Children and neighbors were all having fun with each other. By the way, it was not a party. It was a vaccine clinic. Vaccine parties is what I call it. We had a, pi a piñata that looks like a germ, and then a stick that looked like a syringe. And when the, ki the kids were hitting the germ really hard, right, because they just got the vaccines. So they were hitting the piñata really hard, and when they finally broke open, a bunch of candy and home COVID test 19 fell off. <laughs> this is the strategy we used to successfully vaccinate 24,000 people in one of the worst ranking states and how we're, making childhood, uh, how we're making progress in other childhood vaccines, too. See, public health has its reputation for being sterile, inaccessible, and boring. But I believe that doesn't have to be. I believe that we can achieve our highest goals by making public health fun again and validating the cultures of the community we want to serve. I serve on the Health Equity Commission for the state of Colorado. I was also honored with one of the biggest honors that Colorado, that someone in Colorado can receive. The governor of Colorado declared September 20th as Julissa Soto Day. But I told everyone that I become a public health servant in the trunk of a car. I came to United States as an undocumented immigrant from Mexico with a super abusive husband. I told everyone that I'm so lucky not to be arrested and detained or locked in cages. But I didn't know where to go. And soon, my husband abused, sent me to the hospital again. And there I met a woman who I call my white angel, who helped me navigate the healthcare system and recover from my injuries. And she made me want to give back. So I started looking at the healthcare system, how it doesn't work for my community, how the hours and locations didn't work for those people that have two jobs. So I remember going to the clinic with my two kids. And the doctors asked a bunch of questions, and I barely spoke English. Now that I speak very well now, but better. So I was like, they, they asked me a bunch of questions, like, what's your name? What's your address? Do you have insurance for you and me today? Those questions might sound simple. But when you're undocumented, it can be scary. It's always that. Why they're asking all these questions? Should I trust them? Do they want to deport me? It seems that for marginalized and immigrant communities, it's the safest option is not to get any health care at all. As soon as I got out of the hospital, I started doing public health work. One of my com best community innovations earned recognition from the Center of Disease Control. And from there, nothing could stop me. I have a care for everyone, everywhere I could. And then the pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic struck. And I started seeing all these problems at a much larger scale. Black and brown communities, communities that don't speak English were largely among the unvaccinated. And I keep hearing on TV and the news and committee meetings, Latinos are just vaccine hesitant. And I knew from my own experience that that was a myth. The problem was access. Do we have vaccines in our communities, in our neighborhoods? For some of us, it's the hood. For me, it's my neighborhood. Are vaccines available for all? I knew what I needed to do. I needed to take vaccines to the community and speak their own language. I'm a Catholic woman like most Latinos in the US, so I call up a church that I know holds six masses every Sunday. And I talked to the priest and I asked him if he would let me uh, uh, organize a vaccine clinic at his church and help me save lives. He immediately said yes and told me to be there all day. We started at 6 a.m. with one clinic bus from the state. And when the priest called me to the pulpit, I said to everyone what the Lord has taught me, love the neighbor as the self. I said to everyone, you might be young, handsome, and healthy, and COVID-19 wouldn't do nothing to you. But think about the most vulnerable population, the children, the pregnant woman, your grandma, your grandpa. If something would have happened to them, 
Are you prepared that to, to have that in your conscience? The room was silent, like you guys. And everybody calmly considering what I just said. So I went out. We ran out of vaccines the first four hours. The first four hours, so I have to call the state to bring two more buses. After that, I went to the state, the health departments, and everyone else is saying, does this look like hesitancy to you? Over 17 hours, we have vaccinated 1,279 Latinos. And one day, does this look like hesitancy to you? The problem was access and how the community was approached. So I started with working with other community groups. We have given 130,000 home COVID-19 test boxes, 70,000 masks, and 24,000 new vaccines. Those numbers sound easy, but it's super difficult. What this whole experience taught me is that we cannot leave communities without health care by waiting on the sidelines. Providers need to approach the communities that they wish to serve with respect and dignity to build that trust. Some of you might call it cultural awareness. Some of you might call it cultural competency. But I argue what, they, what matters most is knowing, where the, uh, the, knowing more than where the people come from or, or what they do is what I call cultural validation. Validating the life experiences and struggles of the community. For example, I have tell you guys that many immigrants don't want to answer personal questions, be a fear, a fear of being deported. Providers can include their patients in their conversations, like when they're vaccinating the children, say, Senora, I'm updating your daughter's health record right here. You want to come and see it with me? Or when providers are talking to each other, they can include the, the patient by saying, Senora, I'm talking to my colleague about what vaccines are available for your child. When, when providers talk among each other, each other, and we don't speak English, right? We don't speak English, and they talk about each other, we understand when they say our child name. But when they say our child name, we start freaking out. We're like, oh my God, is my son sick? Is my child sick? Providers need to approach the community so they can um, build that respect. And the funny thing is that when I developed the curriculum of cultural validation, I was, thinking for my, I was thinking of my brothers and sisters, the immigrant and refugee community. But in practice, it's good for everyone. If you are a white American mom talking to a white American doctor, will you feel better if they speak to you in terms that you can understand? If our son locations work for you? Vaccine parties take it to a whole different level. Instead of the boring, sterile, and oh, I don't want to go, we bring food and entertainment. For you guys, it might not seem the enchiladas is that important, right? But it signals the community that we value their culture. You can do the same things with the Jewish community, serving kosher food. With the Muslim community, serving halal food. And by bringing a bouncy house, a clown, a mariachi band, our, our community gets super, super excited about this, right? And also, providers dressing as superheroes. We give children the choice to choose who do they want to get their vaccines from. Spider-Man, The Flash, Wonder Woman, yay! Right? Yes! Mija, you're going to get your vaccine from Wonder Woman. And the kids probably think that they're going to be Wonder Woman after they get their vaccines, but that doesn't happen. <laughs> and with all these changes, we started to see the changes that we dream for years in public health. Access to care, access to vaccines, lower rates of untreated diabetes, and better health come for all. If I can say in one word what cultural validation is, the word is caring. I needed to say that slow because if I say it's caring, you guys might think it's scary because of my accent, right? But no, it's caring. We're building a relationship that will last for generations. Not only one encounter, when you leave, you come back. Because when children are super happy, they tell their parents. And when parents are satisfied, they tell their neighbors. And next thing you know, you have a whole community with access to our vaccine and care. So don't be surprised if access to care 
Look at la vida different when you go to the doctor and get your vaccines, right? You might see a clown, a mariachi band, playing in the background while getting your vaccines. Muchísimas gracias.